All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the case may be. Uh, welcome to our first topic in our Intro to College Psychology journey. Uh, this is going to be a review topic. Uh, the purpose of this topic is simply going to be to catch you back up to speed on all of the items that we covered during your time in our nutrition unit. Um, kind of give you a base of all that stuff, quick review. So when you go into your college psych class, some of the things that uh, it would be expected that you'd remember, uh, you'll get one more time. So uh, one thing I'll warn you before we get started, it's you know as we as we go basically through a full quarters of material um, in the next oh 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I'll do my best to kind of transition, but it is going to kind of hop around. So if you need to stop and kind of review some things as we go, uh, feel free to do that. And as always, if you if you need to stop for a while, hit the pause button um, and catch back up. Uh, first of all, before we get back in, uh, I want to just go over once again what psychology is. So psychology essentially here is the definition that uh, comes right from our textbook is the scientific study of behavior and thought that is tested through scientific research. Now, a couple things that are important to note in that definition, it is in fact scientific research. And I've given kind of a layman's definition of what that all means and essentially what it means is why people do what they do and think what they think. That's what the study is. Um, getting back to the scientific part of that though for a second, you know, it, it, the same way that psychology will study behavior and thought, it's very much how, you know, a chemistry studies matter, biology studies life and the processes of the body, geology, you know, geology class would study earth, physics will study matter and energy and how those two things relate. Um, this is just another type of science. Uh, it falls under life sciences and it studies behavior and thoughts, why people do what they do and think what they think. Uh, the goals of psychology, there are four main goals that you will want to um, be responsible for. First of all, describe. We want to be able to observe behaviors and be able to describe them to um, other people, other researchers, other friends, whatever the case may be. Well, there. I'll just erase the rest of it. Um, second is to explain. We want to be able to explain why the behavior occurred. Uh, that gets up into our, you know, the scientific study part. We need to be able to make some sense of it all. Uh, third, we need to be able to predict. We need to look at somebody's past lifestyles, their past uh, upbringing, their environment they're living in, uh, maybe processes going on in their body, and be able to predict what type of behavior that they will um, exhibit. Uh, and then lastly, and most importantly, trying to influence. Um, you try to, by predicting the behavior, you then uh, try to influence, maybe get people uh, away from negative type behaviors and back into some positive life choices, life behaviors, uh, and thought processes. Okay, um, as with any science, you have to do research to be able to understand the people that you are, you are studying, or the, in this case, the people or animals that you are studying. studying. And, you know, in psychology, we have a various um, toolbox of, of research methods that we'll use, and I'll just cover a couple of them here. So, first of all, naturalistic observation is kind of how it sounds. It's viewing the subject in its natural habitat. Uh, this uh, type of research is not as common anymore. At this point, it's just so difficult to do successfully. Um, people do it more with, say, animals. Um, because they're not as as um, suspicious of new people, new things coming into their environment. I know we we watched the famous video of Jane Goodall uh, going and and observing the apes in a naturalistic setting. That's you know those types of studies are not as common anymore. But uh, if you can do it successfully, it is one of the most um, valid type of study simply because your subject is behaving in a most natural sense. Uh, the second type of study is called a case study. Uh, it's a series of detailed accounts of experiences, primarily usually kept uh, in a journal format by the therapist or by the um, researcher. And they are usually constructed from interviews that are done either with the patient 
or with people who spend time around the patient or the subject. Third type of study is a cross-sectional study. Uh, it's a study that is done with various age groups at one point in time. So let's say you wanted to uh, study how different age groups um, experience either death or loss or divorce or something like that. You could take five people who are, or five kids who are in kindergarten, five kids who are in third grade, five kids who are in eighth grade, and so on and so forth, and view how they are handling um, some kind of loss at the same point in time. Uh, going along with that then is a longitudinal study. Uh, it's similar to a cross-sectional study in the sense that it wants to try and um, compare different age groups that are going through a type of event. However, a longitudinal study will take a single test group, say 20 kindergartners, and they will study that same group of kindergartners at various ages. So they'll take 20 kids, study them when they're kindergartners, wait till they're third graders, study them again, study them again when they're eighth graders, and so on and so forth. So you have the exact same test subjects each time. Now obviously if we're viewing the difference between a cross-sectional study and a longitudinal study, uh, the benefit of the cross-sectional, or the rather the longitude or the cross-sectional. No, I had it right. The cross-sectional study is that it is a much more time-efficient uh, study. However, the longitudinal study tends to gather more valid results because your subjects uh, are the exact same throughout the experiment or throughout the activity. Uh, a survey then is just a questionnaire that you will have subjects fill out in hopes that you can, they can detail certain experiences or they can um, convey to you certain thoughts and feelings under certain circumstances. Um, you actually you know the loss thing that I brought up with the cross-sectional and longitudinal. You could do something like that with a survey as well where you'd have a list of 50 questions and maybe have a couple of them focus on you know, how somebody feels um, during a time of loss. And then lastly, an experiment which many of us are familiar with. It's a study done. Uh, in a research researcher controlled setting uh, where you would bring people into a lab setting uh, you would control all the variables of the experiment um, and you could you could uh, change the independent variable so you basically in a, an experiment you're just going to use typical scientific method you'd have your thesis you develop your experiment um, you could determine all the variables um, you know, so for instance, if you were going to do some kind of uh, experiment on how video games, say, impact um, a, a person's ability or a person's desire to be angry, uh, you could bring people in. You could have them in a very controlled setting. You can you could control what games they play. You could control the amount of time that they're playing those games so, for. So for instance, if you had an independent variable, which is the variable that is changed by the researcher, you could increase um, the amount of time that the group is playing. You could increase the type of game and the violence of the game that they are playing. The dependent variable then uh, would be what changes based on the independent variable. So theoretically, um, if you are increasing the violence in the games, you would like to see um, you know, more brain activity in the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that would control anger. Uh, or likewise, if you increase the amount of time, you would expect to see the same um, change in the dependent variable. Um, you will also hopefully have a control group to go along with this experiment. The control group would be the group that the experience, you wouldn't change the independent variable for, so you'd compare results. So say you have 20 kids, you bring them in, you start out, 10 of them would, or well, all 20 would participate using the same game for the same amount of time. Then you would take half of them and you would change the type of game and you could change the amount of time and you could view how the results changed for those 10 people. Uh, Any time that we do an experiment, we'll want to make sure that we avoid a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, if you're wondering what a self-fulfilling prophecy is, I just just occurred to me that um, I hadn't defined this. So, a self-fulfilling prophecy is just uh, where biases impact results. 
you know, if you are a researcher that really, really wants to prove something, you know, you might design an experiment or a questionnaire or whatever the case may be that almost has to give you the results you want, but in that case, uh, the, the results would not be valid to the scientific world um, because they are based on false premises. So there's three main things that we do to make sure that we have, um, that we avoid a self-fulfilling prophecy. First of all is we would use a single blind experiment. In a single blind experiment, participants are unaware that they are being studied. Uh, the most famous case of this instance would be Milgram's obedience to authority experiment uh, where the people actually being studied uh, thought that they were just helping out with the experiment. They were not the actual ones being um, studied when in fact uh, they were. The benefit of this is by participants not knowing that they're being studied, they're more likely to act natural, and the more natural they act, the more valid the results would be. Second of all, you'd have a double blind study where neither the experimenter or the participants know who is being studied. Uh, so for instance, if I am the experimenter, I would design the experiment and then I would hire people um, and my instructions to them would be something along the lines of, I want you to bring in 50 people, I want 10 of them to be treated this way, 10 to be treated this way, 10, and all the way up to 50. I would not have any idea who those those people were. Um, and in fact, neither would the researchers helping me out. They would just be given numbers that would correspond. And when they'd come in at a certain time, they'd be treated a certain way based on uh, the pre-assigned numbers. These are common in drug trials, um, you know, where they're, they're trying to use experimental drugs to determine uh, whether experimental drugs are useful. Um, and the benefit of that is the, you know, the participants uh, don't know whether or not they're receiving treatment or not, and the experimenters uh, can't say or do anything around the patients that may impact uh, whether they think they're being uh, given the drug. Lastly, we have the placebo effect, also commonly used in drug type trials. It's where a fake drug, usually a sugar pill, uh, is given to subjects to ensure that the effects are valid. Uh, so for instance, if you're testing a drug, you bring 50 people in, 25 of them get the actual drug, 25 of them get a sugar pill. Uh, all people are told that they are getting uh, a dose of the drug. Um, and really the, the important thing here is they, they are hoping then um, that what happens is the people who receive the sugar pill just come back and say, well, I didn't experience any changes, I didn't uh, feel any better, or whatever the case may be. And then the people that did receive the drug obviously would feel better. All right. At this time, then, we're going to switch a little bit more to the realm of diagnosing uh, mental disorders. So we talked a little bit about this. There are four key areas uh, that a patient needs to meet and a psychologist would need to determine that a patient has met um, before they would be diagnosed with an actual mental disorder. So um, first, step one, um, first of all, you need to determine that um, abnormal is actually happening. So the four steps that would be used, as I mentioned, um, first of all, the person's behavior needs to deviate from social norms. So the key part about that is there's a cultural aspect to that, which is very important. Because where you're living, a behavior that would deviate from social norms, um, I'll say eating three large meals a day, um, might be uh, might deviate from social norms and say, you know, a small village in Africa, but obviously if you went up to somebody in our culture and said, you know, I had three big meals today, well, they wouldn't even bat an eye because that's perfectly normal. Uh, second of all, it needs to cause personal distress, meaning it needs to cause you some kind of emotional or physical harm. Third, it needs to decrease functionality, meaning it somehow needs to inhibit your ability to function at your full potential as a human being. And lastly, it needs to be caused by a harmful dysfunction. Now, caused by a harmful dysfunction simply means that um, it has to be caused by some kind of um, 
incorrect processing in your brain. So it has to be caused by an illogical way of viewing things. Um, say, for instance, um, you know, the a common instance is people who suffer from anorexia. You know, they might be very small, 100 pounds. Still, when they look in the mirror, they see a fat person. You know, that would be a harmful dysfunction because that is not a logical way to look at things. All right, once we have determined that we do, in fact, have or are, in fact, dealing with a mental disorder, um, we need to diagnose uh, the specific mental disorder that the person is suffering from. So we talked about this uh, during our nutrition, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Uh, right now, we are on version 4, text revision. The fifth version is coming out uh, sometime this summer. Uh, once that gets approved, uh, for the most part, though, I think all this will stay intact. Otherwise, you might have to do some relearning um, with Mrs. Immel once college psychology starts. But for the time being, uh, there are five axes in the in the DSM. So just so that we're aware, the common terminology is this is called the DSM. There are four axes or four chapters, if you want, in the DSM each covering or each focusing on um, a different part of diagnostics. So the first axis will cover all clinical disorders. Other than mental retardation and personality disorders. Access to then um, would just be focusing on those personality disorders. And mental retardation. Access three is going to focus on all medical conditions that can have, both can and cannot have um, psychological causes. So medical conditions. With a focus on uh, medical conditions that are caused by psychological problems and also medical conditions that can lead to psychological problems. Um, Axis 4 is simply a list of common environmental factors occurring in disorders. Uh, things like poverty, divorced households, um, urban cities, all kinds of common environmental factors that would lead somebody to be at a high risk for developing uh, a mental disorder. And then lastly is uh, Our GAF, the Global Assessment of Functionality. And all this is is a big scale uh, which shows at what level an individual is functioning at. Uh, the importance of this would be able to look at you know, a person, given their list of common environmental factors or given the environmental factors they're dealing with, what should be their standard, you know, global assessment of functionality um, based on, and then you can compare that to where they're actually at just to determine how severe their disorder is. Because in the, the interesting thing about psychology is that depending on how severe the functionality is, it can actually impact um, the diagnosis, whereas in in a in a medical case, the how severe your symptoms are at a time might not change the 
um, diagnosis, the severity of the disease, the severity of the disorder actually does have a drastic impact on the diagnosis in psychology. All right. Let me just make sure here. Yep, that's exactly where we need to be. All right, taking another leap here now to the world of learning. Okay, we focused on two uh, main areas of learning. I'm going to throw in token economy for the purpose of this review as well. So we have condi classical conditioning and operational conditioning. Actually, it's operant conditioning. A P E R A N T. All right, so classical conditioning, first of all, uh, for those of you that remember the Pavlov's dogs experiment, that's probably the most famous incident of classical conditioning um, being exhibited um, within research. Basically, in classical conditioning, we're going to use four steps or four, um, four areas to control somebody's behavior or influence somebody's behavior. Uh, the four areas that you need to be familiar with in this experiment or this uh, type of learning is, first of all, an unconditioned stimulus. Uh, that is the event that renders response before conditioning. So if you remember Pavlov's dogs, uh, the event that rendered a response prior to conditioning was food being presented to the dog. So the stimulus was food being presented to the dog um, in much the way um, food being good food being presented to you or I um, would probably give us some kind of response. Same thing with the dogs, and that response is called the unconditioned response. So it's the response to the stimulus prior to conditioning. Uh, for you and I, um, you might get we might get kind of excited. The dogs actually started drooling or salivating, as it's called. Uh, so so far. We have the unconditioned stimulus, which was the food being presented, the unconditioned response, which was the dogs salivating, and what Pavlov was trying to do was to get the dogs to salivate without any food being presented. So what he did was he brought in a conditioned stimulus. It was it, The definition of a, one, of a conditioned stimulus is a once neutral event that will now provoke a conditioned response. In the case of Pavlov and his dogs, the neutral event was a bell. So he had a bell that he rang. Um, the important part here is this needs to be paired with this for a period of time in order for that to work. So for a period of time, Pavlov, every time he brought the food out, right before bringing the food out, he would ring a bell. So every time he rang a bell, he'd bring the food. He'd ring a bell, bring the food, ring a bell, bring the food. Eventually, over time, every time that the bell rang, the dogs knew there's food coming, so much so that eventually um, they developed a conditioned response or a learned response where all it took was the bell ringing and they would salivate at the sound of a bell. Okay, classical conditioning. Moving on to operant conditioning then. Okay, there are three main steps in operant conditioning. First of all, some kind of behavior will occur. The subject, whoever that is, uh, will exhibit, exhibit some kind of behavior. Uh, once that behavior occurs, whoever's doing the conditioning, you know, be it a teacher, a family member, whatever the case may be, uh, will invoke some kind of reinforcement or punishment. This reinforcement or punishment will then uh, decrease or increase the occurrence of the behavior that happens. Okay, now, the most important part in operant conditioning, or really the only port, part that the uh, conditioner controls, is number two, what is being done uh, in terms of the reinforcement and the punishment. There are four types, or really there's two types of reinforcement, two types of punishment that can be used in operant conditioning. First of all, in positive reinforcement, that is just having a desirable stimulus added to the situation a desirable stimulus added. So something. So let's say um, you clean your room and your mom gives you a cake or something like that, something desirable. Uh, a negative reinforcement is where an undesirable stimulus, stimulus is taken away. 
Okay, so um, let's say every Tuesday you have to cut the lawn. Uh, however, you watched your dog all weekend, your parents were out of town, and to reward you for that, they don't make you cut the lawn on Tuesday. So they take something that is undesirable, uh, they take that away, and the hopes is that next time um, you will be more likely to watch the dog again. A punishment, on the other hand, is where an undesirable stimulus is added. Okay, so something that you do not like is added. Um, well, for instance, you know, for uh, for anybody who was spanked when they were younger, uh, getting hit on the butt is definitely an undesirable. So that is something that would be punishment versus negative punishment. It's where something desirable is taken away. For those of us that were grounded um, or sent to our rooms for timeout when we were growing up, uh, that would be an example of negative punishment. Okay, the desirable would be just the freedom uh, to move around the house or go outside and play. That desirable is taken away. When we look at classical conditioning and operant conditioning, the important um, the important thing to look at is we are both in both cases trying to control behavior. Now, one thing I'll mention. Um, in terms of operant conditioning, when you're using a reinforcement, you're always trying to increase behavior. So you'll notice down here there's positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Whenever you see that word negative reinforcement, I want you to think of reinforcing the behavior, making the behavior stronger, making it increase. Because otherwise that term negative reinforcement can be awfully confusing. You think of the term negative and you think of taking something away, when in reality the negative reinforcement is actually um, the conditioner doing something to increase the likelihood of the behavior. On the other hand, punishment will always decrease the behavior. Okay, so likewise, you see punishment down here, it's always um, having an end result of stopping some kind of behavior. The main difference with classical conditioning is where um, where the stimulus is happening. So up here, the the class or the conditioned stimulus always has to occur with the unconditioned stimulus. So it's happening at the same time um, that a stimulus is being added. So over here, this is a stimulus-first model. Operant conditioning, on the other hand, is a behavior first model. So in classical conditioning, you provide a stimulus to control the behavior that comes afterwards. In operant conditioning, you let a behavior occur, and then you provide the stimulus after that will either increase or decrease the behavior. All right, one thing I wanted to mention as well is something called a token economy. It's another type of learning uh, that occurs. In fact, it's probably the one of the most important um, types of learning that occurs in our society today. Uh, token economy is just where materials of no value are given, which can be exchanged for items of value for positive behaviors in hopes of increasing that behavior. So it's a type of positive reinforcement where a behavior occurs, um, you're given something of little or no value, acquiring those things, you can later exchange them for something of value, uh, and that will obviously increase that behavior. Um, the, probably the most relevant uh, token economy, well, we live in a token economy, as a matter of fact. Money has no value when you think about it. Money is simply paper. Okay. The reason that money is so valuable is because we can exchange it for items that have real value to us. Okay, you can pay for gas to make your car go. Okay, you can pay for that iPhone or that iPod. You can pay for a computer, or whatever the case may be. All those things have true value to us. Money is just paper. Okay, with which has little or no value. Okay, and we give out money to people um, for behaviors that we like at our jobs um, to promote those behaviors, so they will continue them. Okay. Another jump here, the next thing we're going to talk about is stress and coping with stress. OK, 
Okay, first of all, I'm going to give you a definition of stress. Are you ready for it? It's a long one. Oh, what just happened? I don't know what just happened. All right, try again. There we go. All right, so here's our definition. I'll read it, and then uh, I'll point out the most important parts of this definition. So, stress is a psychological and physical response of the body that occurs whenever we must adapt to changing conditions, whether those conditions be real or perceived, positive or negative. Although everyone has stress in their lives, people respond to stress in different ways. Some people seem to be severely affected, while others seem calm, cool, and collected all the time. Regardless, we all have it. It's also important to note that there are two types of stress. Use stress, which is good stress, and distress, uh, which is not so good stress. So, the most important parts. It is a psychological and physical response. So it is not only... Um, it is not only a response in terms of, uh, you know, thoughts that we have, but it also impacts the actual way that your body um, operates, okay? It impacts um, what type of um, processes your body will activate. Um, in, in a very stressful situations, your body will go into a flight or fight or flight response um, and will shut down any long-term processes in in exchange for focusing on the processes that will help you survive in that moment, more of an animalistic instinct. Okay, so it happens whenever we must adapt to changing conditions. So anytime anything in our lives changed, whether those are real or perceived, positive or negative, okay, so these, these responses happen whether or not, or during a change. So the most important word is change. Anytime something in our life changes, we experience a certain type of stress, okay? If you get a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend, you are going to experience a certain amount of stress because it's a change in your life um, that even though it's probably a positive, um, you're adapting to a new lifestyle, okay? Uh, although everyone in their life, uh, and everyone has stress, okay? Everyone has stress in their lives because everybody is dealing with changing circumstances. And then the last thing I want to point out um, is this down here? There's eustress and distress. Okay, eustress being good stress, positive stress. Um, the best example I have is for those of you that have ever been on stage for anything, um, have ever done any types of performing or athletic competition. Right before you go out there, uh, you have that butter, those butterflies in your stomach. Um, that is eustress, and you can use that to focus your energy, focus your thought. Um, and help you do the best you can. All right. The SS, the SRRS um, is the Social Readjustment Rating Scale. It is what we use in psychology to determine how much stress is impacting your life. It was developed by two... Um, two psychologists, Holmes and Rahe, they did an experiment on a thousand um, naval sailors, and they were able to determine, uh, without a doubt, that <clears throat> people who have more stress in their lives and experience a greater amount of change in their lives are more likely to experience medical problems. So there's a direct correlation between the stress in our lives and the amount of medical problems we have. Man, I'm just having all kinds of problems here. All right. So how do we deal with stress then? Well, there's two types of ways that we deal with stress. Coping mechanisms, coping mechanisms are the most common way in which people deal with stress. The coping mechanisms are the things that we do as humans to avoid dealing with stress. Okay, um, they can be the really small things like just turning on some music uh, to try and think about other things. It can be cleaning like Mr. Volk does to try and help um, take your mind off of the things that are causing you stress. 
or people can resort to some more severe forms of coping mechanisms um, like projecting. Projecting is common um, in people who have, are at odds with a feel, you know, feelings of being homosexual. Um, oftentimes, if they're feeling like they might be homosexual, they will um, act out or bully people who are homosexuals, openly homosexual. Um, to try to try and hide their actual feelings, um, or coming down with a psychological disorder is another way that the body subconsciously copes uh, with stress in your life. That um, coping mechanisms that are, that is tend to be a more unhealthy form of of dealing with stress. The better option is reframing. Reframing is dealing with stress by viewing the cause of the stress in a realistic manner. It's by talking to yourself, restating um, the truth about the events, and trying to essentially make convince yourself that it's not that important. So, for instance, if you break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, to look at the situation and say, you know, um, the chances of us being together for the rest of our lives isn't very good. We probably weren't going to be together anyways. This was going to happen eventually anyways. So it's better that we do it now. That would be a, you know, a more healthy way to look at the situation. Or say if you fail a test, uh, to look at that failed test and say, you know, you know, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, uh, nobody's going to care about that test. It's not going to define who I am. I probably won't even remember this test in 10 years from now. Okay, so that tends to be a more healthy way of dealing with problems. All right, getting closer to the end here. Stay with me. When you get to college psychology, um, a big thing that you're going to have to understand is that there are different types of psychologists. The same way that when we talk about scientists, there are different types of scientists. There are biologists, there are geologists, there are chemists, there are psych or, uh, physicists. Um, there are all types of different scientists. Same thing holds true for psychologists. Psychology is really just an umbrella term, and there's different types of people um, that study underneath that umbrella. So we're going to talk about the five uh, or six rather main paradigms uh, that occur under uh, the umbrella term of psychology. First of all is behavioralism. Now all these paradigms, what's going to make them unique is what they view um, as being the main influence on our behavior. So in behavioralism, behavioralists, behavioral psychologists will believe that events in our environment that either reward or punish our behaviors are the main influence on what we act like and think. Okay, in other words, a behavioralist would be a strong believer that conditioning is the number one cause of our behavior, that our conditioning um, the reinforcers and punishments that we experience are, have the biggest impact on our behaviors. And they might ask a question in their research like, can good study habits be learned? Okay, So for instance, they might look at, um, you know, can the rewards or the punishments that come from tests lead us to good study habits? Second is psychoanalysis. A psychoanalytical psychologist uh, will believe that unconscious motives, um, our thoughts and our unconscious mind, will be the number one thing that influences our behavior. And they might ask a question like, how can our dreams impact our behaviors while we are awake? Okay, or can they? Can our dreams uh, impact our behaviors while we're awake? Third is humanism. Okay. They believe that a constant yearning to achieve our full human potential um, or our, our pushing towards achieving our potential, that is what influences all our behaviors uh, and decisions. So do I believe I can prepare for and pass the test would be a research question they might ask. Cognitivism. The word cognitive meaning thought. Um, they believe that how we process, store, and, and retrieve information in our brain is the number one thing that impacts our be impacts our behaviors. So essentially, um, the way our brain works and processes everything, um, all the stimuli, all the perceptions um, that we we go through in a day, that is what imp impacts our behavior. Uh, they might they might ask a question like, how does caffeine affect memory? 
Okay, does it have an impact on the brain and does that impact affect our memory? Okay, our fifth one is socioculturalism. They believe that your upbringing, your nurturing that you're growing up, that you grow up with, uh, that is going to be the number one that influences your behavior. So your parents, uh, where you live, what type of environment, um, those types of experiences. I just lose this. Oh, there we go. How do people of different genders and ethnicities interact with one another? So that'd be the type of research question um, a socioculturalist would ask. Lastly, a biological psychologist. Um, they they determine that the process of processes of the body are the number one thing that impact our behavior. And they would ask a question like, do genes affect your intelligence and your personality? All right, our last slide here is going to be on emotion and motivation. This might be the most important thing that you could possibly learn um, in your life. This is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Maslow was a humanist who believed that everybody's behavior uh, was based on their want to reach potential um, and, re and reach what he called self-actualization. However, Maslow, Abraham Maslow was his name, um, quickly saw that not everybody's behaviors suggested that they were reaching for the stars, so to speak. So after endless amounts of research, he was able to determine that not everybody's life situation allows them to act in a way that would achieve their full potential. That depending on your life situation, um, what your needs are uh, will impact your behaviors. So let me just explain how this works. So if somebody, um, if somebody, well, basically the way it works is you have this period and you work from the top or the bottom up. So once your need is filled, you move up to the next rank. So first of all, the first needs that a human being needs to fulfill are their basic physiological needs. Things like they need to be able to breathe, they need to have food, they need to have water, they need to have shelter, clothing, and sleep. Okay? If they have that, they will move on to focusing on achieving the next level, which is safety and security. Okay, they will look to gain things like health, employment, property, family, and social stability. If they have that, their decisions that they make in their life won't be um, focused on getting it because they already have it. Okay, instead they will focus on behaviors at the next level, which is love and belonging. They will seek friendship, family, intimacy, and a sense of connection. If they have that, uh, they will seek to gain confidence, achievement, respect of others, and the need to be a unique individual. Okay, And if they achieve that, they will then focus on activities and behaviors that will help them reach their full potential as a human being. Okay, Where this becomes uh, really relevant is in school. Okay, Some of uh, your fellow classmates or some of the people in this building might not have um, family and social stability. Okay, Maslow would say that if they, if you have a truly dysfunctional family and you don't have food because of a lack of employment in your family and you don't have social stability, you are going to um, you are going to be motivated to fulfill only those needs, that your decisions, the things you're going to do in your life, are going to be centered around only achieving those things. Okay, If you are focusing your life on a, just achieving um, or just fulfilling your need for food or water, school may not be as important for you Okay, because you're focused on your physiological needs. Okay, School falls more up here in these levels. Okay. Same thing if, if, you ha if you have depression because you have no friends, 
Okay, if you have no friends and you have um, a little sense of connection with your environment, school might not seem as important to you because you're going to focus, first of all, on not feeling so lonely, on feel, feeling more connected with the people around you. You know, it really isn't until you achieve these three levels and have everything in those three levels that school has any importance to you. Okay, and we in education are starting to um, realize that a little bit more. Um, and helping kids out with that a little bit more to see the value in education uh, regardless of where they are on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. All right, well that is pretty much it for our review today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to contact me in any way you seem fit. Uh, other than that, once you have taken all your notes on this video, you've studied up and you're ready for your assessment on your review topic, just contact me and we'll set up a time to get that exam taken, uh, and then we'll move on. All right, have a great day.